Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Christopher Brown, and I'm pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. Not only because he has been a friend of my family for some time, but he was, uh, he, he we kind of grew uh, close because he was the very first politician I ever interviewed when I worked way back when at the Orno Weekly Times in Orno, Ontario, and he was regional counselor for Ward 3 and 4 for the municipality of Clarington. He is back after a four-year hiatus from council, and he is back sitting on council now at, in that same position as regional counselor for Ward 3 and 4. I am pleased and honored to welcome Councillor Willie Wu. Willie, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. And as you said, uh, we go way back, and I even go further back with uh, your parents and your, and I say grandparents. So uh, growing up in a little village of Newcastle when we moved here in 1954, I was uh, a baby born in Peterborough and uh, moved down to a little village of Newcastle. Now, for your viewers, and I think. Uh, most of your viewers are probably within the uh, Alberta area uh, and across the uh, country and maybe around the globe, Chris. We do but, have uh, surprisingly a large number of followers in Ireland, UK, and Germany, and all across this great country. But yes, continue on. Yeah, no, very good. Because again, uh, Little Newcastle is uh, just east of Toronto. So as Toronto seems to be the center of the universe, and uh, we're a little village of, uh, well, now, when I when we first came here in 54, we were about 800 people. Now we're, oh, nudging in on 11,000 people in this little village. Wow, how, how time has flown since I left when it was about 8,200 people. So it shows you how much time has grown in 10 years. So there you go. Um, so... so I'm going to get the I'm going to get the question started here and I want to ask the question that I've asked every single elected official and candidate to be elected and that is Willie where did your sense of duty to serve come from Well I go back to that uh, little village um uh, a little boat 800 people uh, our doctor as you may remember Dr. Miklas uh Hungarian uh Ukrainian, my best friend. Um, we had Polish war veteran, as you may remember, English war bride. We had Dutch, we just had a mix. And it's kind of funny, the uh, terms of that are used now, diversity or multicultural, we just had it. We all just looked at each other as equals. And uh, you know, that sense of duty would be as immigrants, my parents had a restaurant. And uh, just how the community embraced my family, um, like I said, immigrants, but uh, it wasn't until there was an article when I was first elected on council, the reporter for the Toronto Star said, I was the first visible minority on council. So at that time I was working at Goodyear and the guys had the newspaper out and they were asking me, who's this visible minority that's on council? Now it just gives you a sense, Chris, and I think you know, you, you understand that and realize that, uh, have them growing up that the wolves were just part of the community. And uh, as we grow into that sense of community, uh, I think it's incumbent upon myself because the demographics are changing so much. I mean, as I said, we're the, we're the only visible minority at that time, but we certainly are not. Uh, I am still campaigning, even though I am a claim. I think it is. Um, not everybody knows who Willie Wu is, but I think it's a coming upon myself to reach out, go into the neighborhoods that, uh, uh, if you want to say, those uh, uh, demographics and that knock on their door. And I can honestly say, you know, the reception, reception has been positive. Uh, when I've gone out knocking on doors, unfortunately, I can't knock on every one of them. Uh, my campaign team is basically myself and my wife. Now. So I go out and blitz uh, the community in North America. But I'm trying to make a point of it just so that uh, people get to know myself and feel comfortable. So that sense, I guess, it is a carryover on how my parents were accepted in the community. I grew up thinking nothing of it. We just, uh, 
you know, played around with all the other kids, and work with the other kids, right? From uh, from I was in public school to high school and onwards and into our working careers. And we just always remain uh, if you want to say that small town charm, that camaraderie. So you know, if you want to say that sense, for me, it's incumbent upon myself you now to welcome people into the community. And also I, I want to turn back to that very first election that you ran in in 2006, and I want to go back to election night for you. After a long, hard-fought campaign, because let's be honest, uh, municipal campaigns can be challenging because you don't have the party infrastructure that provincial or federal parties do. You don't. Uh, you're trying to get elected. Uh, sometimes municipal politics can be a uh, who knows who better uh, type of uh, atmosphere. On election night, though, you are victorious in the Ward 3 of Clarington. What was that feeling like? What was that feeling like for you when you got that blue check mark beside your name or that call saying, congratulations, you're councillor elect for the uh, municipality of Clarington for Ward 3? Well, certainly it is hard fought. I would say that any candidate, and if I'm not mistaken, Chris, you were a candidate at one time. And, 2010. Uh, yes. And uh, not 2006, because again, now just to give you a little insight, in 1999, I did run for regional councillor. And uh, that was the first year that they used mail in ballots. And I ran against an incumbent. And uh, I was unsuccessful by 141 votes, but that's uh, for somebody that just coming out of the game and running against me, uh, it, it was deflating, don't get me wrong. But I sat out two terms, they were three-year terms at the time, and I came back in 2006, and there were three other candidates for that position. Now, in hindsight, when I look back, Chris, those three candidates are still friends of mine. We ran a clean election, if I can use that term, which seemed to be unusual now. No mudslinging. We ran on our own merits and what we were going to bring to the table. There was no incumbent at that time. And uh, just getting back to that election night, uh, we were new to the game. We were basically at our home uh, watching it on Rogers Cable 10, the community uh, network, and just a sense of relation when the ballots are all counted. And uh, I guess you can say, uh, it was uh, it's a sprint, as you know, uh, right from the time that uh, uh, you can start knocking on doors and putting up election signs. Uh, you get up in the morning, that's all you're taking. That's all you're doing when you're sleeping. That's all you're doing. I shouldn't say it's a nightmare, but it's there when you're even sleeping, sleepless nights. And you better remember at the time, I was also still working. So, you know, even though there was working hours, you put in your day, that next thing you know, the back of the hustings. But it was a such a relief to become, uh, if I can say, victorious. And uh, to be congratulated by those that were also running for the same position. How much of a weight and responsibility comes upon your shoulders the day after the election? Because you are now the official uh, councillor elect. You're not sworn in at that time. But you now have the responsibility and the duty to dictate where money is going to be allocated, where money is going to be spent on a municipal level. How much of a weight and responsibility was put on your shoulders by yourself or even by your community, do you feel, that when you made decisions at the council table, you had to make sure you're doing it in the best of the community? How much was that? responsibility for you? Well, it's a great responsibility. Um, you know, when you're first coming into it, and I would probably say to most people, and, and uh, when they sit back and, you know, they have concerns and comments, and sometimes now with social media, you know, if I'm looking at the present, uh, if I can use the term armchair quarterback, but until you're sitting in that seat and understanding how the 
machinations of municipal council works. And then it could be probably said about uh, municipal, well, beyond municipal, but we're also dealing with regional at that time, there was a local council. Um, you move up the provincial like federal until you're sitting in that seat. Uh, I don't think one really understands, you know, the complexities of how the workings of a municipality work. So there's a steep, steep, steep learning curve, and you're certainly relying on a staff to guide you along the way, uh, meeting with staff and getting to learn the different areas. Like you were talking about, certainly the finances and the uh, allocation of monies and where the monies go to run that municipality, uh, to speak to the different departments. Uh, like say in our case, there's probably no different than any municipality, but you know, certainly planning is a big issue, how the municipality is going to go. But the other ones, the workings of you know, the operations, you know, the ones that uh, do the snow plowing, you know, the grass cutting, uh, the operations, don't forget the community services and arenas and pools and everything else like that. Um, trying to keep, if you want to say, uh, a level of service that our, uh, let's say, residents come to expect and maintaining it within a certain fiscal framework and trying to be very fiscally responsible. Now, a lot of that does uh, guide us through staff and we have to make those tough decisions. And I would say anybody that gets elected, if you're new to it, I mean, it is a steep learning curve. It is just straight up. And like you said, Chris, first thing we're going to be doing is dealing with the budget for 20, well, in this case, let's say 2023. But anytime you, uh, uh, you get elected, there's a big budget binder that's dropped on your desk. And he's about to pull it out here. <laughs> a little thicker than that. And you've got to go through it and learn. And, and whether you know, you're know you that conscientious to go line item by line item, but certainly you're going to rely on staff to help guide you. So there is a great responsibility. And I, it certainly comes from being fiscally responsible with the taxpayer's money. I, I think I can say this without being disrespectful, but you and I are both students of politics. Politics is something that we've always enjoyed. We, uh, I'm assuming you've watched it. You've been on council for some time. You took a brief absence, but you're back. Um, that first year as an elected official, what was it for you that was the biggest eye-opening experience, but also the biggest learning curve that you had to overcome as an elected official? Because you talked about that armchair expert, the armchair people, the armchair quarterback, sorry. Um, you're right. People think they know what government's like, but once you get in there and you actually sit at that table, it's completely different. So for you, what was the biggest eye-opening experience, but also the biggest learning curve that you had to undertake as an elected official? Well, at that time, and, and uh, you know, I had sat in on council meetings in advance, but you're sitting in the gallery watching. Um, and again, you don't have the in-depth, um, let's say, inside knowledge, because sitting with staff, I am a spectator watching this go on. And uh, now I can say the biggest eye opener, Chris, in all of that, the unexpected at that particular time, going and we were campaigning, not much, nothing was said about uh, an issue that would dominate that term of council from 2006, 2010, which was the energy from waste or the incinerator. And I think you can remember that, Chris, because that was a very, very hot and controversial issue. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, out where you live in Alberta, they've had a grapple with that, I think, up in Edmonton. And this may be about 10 years ago or some, because we do have to deal with the waste at that particular time. A lot of our waste was being trucked down to Detroit, Michigan. And then, it was anticipated that we, there had been a close of borders to taking waste from other country. 
So we have to decide how are we going to deal with our own waste. And again, in some respects, you know, if we're creating it, we should have to deal with it. So the waste, there's a big push, obviously, the blue bins and the free cars. But there are some residual waste that you have to find uh, a source for them, whether you want to bury it or burn it and recapture electricity and maybe just a key. So, you know, coming into that council, that was something that was certainly an eye opener I never expected. Other things, too, from a planning perspective, um, there was a lot of uh, but can see applications that come forward, and if you never met the planning issues, that is certainly a steep burden for you. Because, I, again, I, uh, as someone for who has a municipal background from the administration side, I can tell you that is planning is usually one of the biggest issues that a lot of new councillors and even councillors who have been there for some time stumble over on a regular basis because land use bylaws are so complex sometimes and zoning changes and what a zone and where the zones need to go is so complex sometimes that even the most educated and most knowledgeable person on planning can often sometimes get it wrong. Well, obviously, I mean, you speak very well to that subject, and it's no different whether it be in the municipality of Clarendon or right across this country. Uh, and it is, in fact, what had happened uh, on our council at that particular time. We used to have what they call general purpose and administration, GTNA. So everything would be done during the day. Council meeting the next week, you modify everything. And the planning reports became so voluminous and it took up quite a bit of time that planning and uh, development services had its own agenda, had its own evening. So that's how we ended up splitting that off away from that because the planning applications were just, uh, let's just say, daunting. Well, for the GPNA, it was just too much. To bear, and then on top of that, you have to handle the other departments. So, uh, yes, that's probably one that uh, councillors are going to have to, the new ones especially, understand how, and this, what, with our area growing as rapidly as it is, you know, and we have 12 secondary studies come forward to this council. But, uh, it's going to take up a lot of our time during this four years with the growth that is anticipated. I, I'm going to talk about the four years coming up here in a few minutes, but I want to get to uh, the last four years, because in 2018, you announced that you were leaving politics, you were stepping back for a bit. Um, but in 2022, you've decided you're coming back and you're coming back to the same position that you were. You have been acclaimed, as we've mentioned already, but you are still out there. What was the decision behind, A, getting out of politics and then after four years thinking, OK, it's time to get back in? Was there an issue that you said, my voice needs to be on council because of this reason? Or I think we need to address this issue. And I think I'm the one who can sort of push that uh, uh, issue forward or that policy forward. What, what, what happened between 2018 and 2022 that made you think, OK, let's go back again? <laughs> Well, Chris, uh, I had three terms of 12 years uh, where I think I did make a positive difference. I'm very mm -hmm. proud of my track record. And I thought at the time, I mean, uh, just to give you an idea, I'm just a little bit older than your dad. So to give you a rough idea. And, uh, you know, um, there's always, you know, that talk about term limits. And I can understand some of that where there are politicians, it doesn't matter what level of government that you're in, but if I can use the term stale, that uh, there should be uh, a time for that person to hang up and let me blood in. Well, I didn't want to get to that point where I got stale. I wanted to, if you want to say, step away. I thought at the time that we were on a good trajectory of uh, what we had in place. Uh, so I left, and again, uh, as you know, uh, I figured that there would be two spots on a council of seven. One to replace myself, and normally what happens is 
a local counselor or local counselors would want to move up. It's no different than how if I ran against uh, another person and uh, one was going to win and one's going to lose. In this case, I figured it'd be the same, but uh, there was a uh, provincial member of parliament. The provincial election was before the municipal. Uh, I was unsuccessful, put uh, his name in uh, for that same regional council seat that I was vacating. And as it turned out, that particular person um, had more votes than in the two local counties. So there was three new faces on council. And you know, that's not bad, but uh, now this is where it comes in. Uh, uh, once a politician, I guess you can say I was a politician when I was listening in, you know, because again, with a pandemic, most of the uh, committee and council meetings were much stream. I followed along and I felt that uh, uh, that path that I thought was set for me to head, uh, there's a lot of, let's just say, uh, uh, disagreements on the council floor. And I felt that they were more personal as opposed to disagreements on policy. And uh, what was happening, it was just more. Uh, personality issues. And again, you get frustrated when you look at that and say, look, well, the business of the day is not going to be for the agenda of the day. But, you know, we have business to do and that business is being started. And I can think of one particular project that, um, you know, I got frustrated that I thought that would be one. And again, it's more to do with uh, capital infrastructure, but, um, at the time when I left, there was a project for Double Pad Arena uh, for Bowmanville to finish off the complex that they built with the baseball lines in West Stockburn and uh, the Double Pad Arena. Now, again, the cost of that particular time, gymnasium and everything else, would be, let's say, in the $40 million range. I thought that the show should have gone in the ground in 2019. It never did. It hasn't gone in, but that uh, price tag now has moved to over $60 million. But that's not unusual in these times with the pandemic. Cost has just been driven out of this world. But you know, the timeline to get that, uh, that facility study that was commissioned would bring a double pack arena to Newcastle in 2030. So obviously that timeline has been pushed back that Newcastle is going. And uh, so, you know, but that's one of the issues, but I think a lot of that has to do with this particular area that I am representing. We haven't had a strong voice, one that would champion the community, and one that would champion the residents, which I would represent in Wards Green Court, and also our municipality. Now, for 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 just for clarification, because in Alberta we don't have regional councillors, we have dist we have municipal districts, but we don't have uh, councillors who sit on one board, one council, and they also sit on a second council from a regional perspective. So, what is your role as a regional councillor? Just for those who are listening, may not know in Ontario, say if they're listening from Saskatoon or Nova Scotia, what is a regional councillor? Just for clarification aspects. I know what it is, but let's hear what from you. No, well, that's a, that's a good question, uh, Chris. Because again, uh, now some of the other uh, municipal politicians I have met through uh, FCN and the uh, right at different, I'd say, levels within the municipal government. Uh, well, here in Ontario, we do have single tier, and the single tier I use, for example, is Toronto. We have two tier governments, upper tier being regional and lower tier being the local government. And uh, uh, at the lower level, let's just say, you know, we're dealing with issues like, again, uh, snow plowing and, and parks and wrecks and fire services. Uh, we also have planning at the local level. Now, elevated up to the regional level. Uh, regional level was planning on a regional wide basis. Uh, fire or police services fall under there. 
water and sewer following that. Um, obviously, public health, and certainly during this pandemic, public health falls under the region. So it gives you sort of an idea between the two. Um, now, do I see somewhere maybe in the future that that is harmonized? I think the uh, previous provincial government, they haven't re-elected, really were looking at that harmonization because as you may know for your uh, viewers within Toronto, it just shows you municipalities, at least here, we're a creature of the province. And it just shows you how quick during that particular election that was happening in Toronto, the provincial government, which they were elected, they came in and uh, reduced the number of seats in the box mistaken, I think, from 44 to 25. And they can do that. And at the time, I think it was being put out there that it may happen to two tier regional government, or regional government, or region of the And I'm just talking about the uh, uh, the uh, North Region, Peel Region. So we operate under two two government. And, uh, and you, you mentioned it here for a second, but Clarington is part of the region of Durham, which is, for those who don't know, goes, and if, correct me if I'm wrong here, goes from the outskirts of Toronto, literally the east end of Toronto, all the way to the uh, east end of Clarington. And Every municipality, every city in that area makes up the region of Durham. So that's Oshawa, Pickering, Ajax, Whitby, uh, Clarington, if I'm not mistaken. And it goes up north to Scugog and Uxbridge, correct? That's correct. And Brock. And Brock. I always forget Brock. Ah! <laughs> the municipalities that form the uh, uh, region of Durham. And from the local municipalities, you elect regional councils. So in the case of Clarity, we have a mayor. Now I look at, there's four wards. One, two, three, and four. So there's a regional councilor for wards one and two, and a regional councilor for three and four. So we are three of the 28 regional councils that sit on the region of the one council. And then there's a chair for the region of Durham. Which gets elected at large because originally it was appointed, but I think it was the Wynne government under Kath, uh, uh, Kathleen Wynne who allowed the change or the, the region wanted it to change. Can you correct me on that one? Well, it was, uh, uh, if you want to see my vote, that uh, we go on, because it was a ballot question. Oh, it was a ballot question. Know. Okay. So I we have the to a direct election of the regional chair as opposed to being appointed by 20 regional councils. Awesome. I want to turn to the municipality of Clarington now and your next term. You have four years. You're back. What is your priority? What is priority number one for Willie Wu heading into this term? Is there, uh, you talk about growth, you talked about that ice, uh, the, the, the recreational side of things, but what is the biggest priority for you over this next four years? I think there's a number of uh, priorities that I do have. I mean, certainly one that I've always, always championed was uh, the attraction of uh, businesses to our community. And I think that is happening. Um, that has, we have been successful uh, during my terms, but certainly during the, uh, uh, let's just say the, uh, this term, I won't say last term because they are still the term of, of uh, council until the new council starting. But in economic development job creation, obviously, are a big priority on You know, part and parcel too, when you look at uh, uh, the way the tax base uh, is shouldered by the residents, the two of the vote, you know, 86%. So if we can provide more commercial and institutional and industrial growth, that, that may help alleviate that pressure on a taxpayer. Uh, obviously, you know, one that is right across the country is affordable housing. And uh, that, when I look at, and I, and I see there, Chris, 
you know, affordable and that can be looked at in a couple of ways. Is it affordable? Somebody that moves out here from Toronto and sells their house for, you know, like a couple of million and, and moves out to Clarendon and, and buys a house for a million dollars? Or is it affordable for those that are, let's say, on the um, lower income scale? And I could probably use that as a first time home buyer, a young couple that are trying to enter the market. Either that um, or those that just have not had an opportunity, you know, that have those jobs that would provide that income or that double income that you can enter the market and buy those. And if I look at the average prices of houses in the market, you're probably looking at probably five to six hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of money for our young people to get into. So our affordable housing. But like I say, on the other end, where you look at those, and I think we need to work more so with the uh, federal, provincial, again, our regional and local governments and our development uh, industry to provide those homes that are affordable. And if I can say rent your income or subsidize. So what's the first step? Oh, sorry, I, I apologize to interrupt here, but I just want to know, the first step in any solution is always the hardest step to make. When it comes to affordable housing, that is a big challenge. And I think you are right when you say Clarington is not unique in this issue. There's a lot of municipalities who I've spoken to over the last few weeks that say affordable housing is their biggest top priority. How do you tackle this issue? Because you have to balance the needs of the people who have houses with the needs of creating new houses as well because if you increase the supply the demand and the cost will go down on those people who have houses who are 500 600 000 who just bought their house so how do you balance that but also how do you take the first step as a council as a regional counselor to say okay we need to tackle this issue because it is a big priority and it is something that we need to do not today but like it should have been done from four years ago? Oh, well, there's no doubt, Chris. I mean, you know, I, if I speak personally, I bought in those rooms of housing when it was uh, at that particular time, at the top of it, let's say at the time, at, when it was at the top of the, let's say, what houses were going for. And then I saw, and just like we're seeing now with interest rates going up, you know, those houses that uh, were being sold, uh, let's say, um, uh, over list, that's what you would see, you know, real estate agents, solar list, or you saw those signs, you know, coming soon, multiple offers, no conditions on financing, no conditions on home inspections. You know, I, I guess in some respects, yes, for those that hot bought at the height of the market, uh, you, and I was there in the, in the swings, that equity, that uh, paper equity, I should say, that you put into it, now that market might be coming back. Now, again, like I said, it was all supply and demand at that particular time. This is what they're saying. There's not enough uh, supply to meet the demand. Um, as we try, and like I said, we have 12 secondary plans coming forward with the municipality. I would hope, and again, I think, John Tory said this as part of this five step plan to get the housing market because we do have developers here in Clarence that could have put the shovel in the ground and have not developed. They were the shovel ran in when I was on council, and that was only two years ago. And uh, you know, um, the land, the, the shovel in the ground, the ability to develop. Is there? Uh, can we develop more? Then we're coming forward. But putting that housing mix, and I think that this is where something that we can uh, work with the developer to try to look at providing the, uh, let's say, non market affordable uh, uh, rent for, let's just say, uh, those uh, groups that are making, say, $30,000 a year. You know, could those houses be? You know, I'll use the term, and, and I think you have that out in certainly Alberta. We've heard the term tiny homes. 
We certainly do. I know a friend of mine who actually is moving into a tiny home. So they are something that people are looking at. You know, Chris, you know, and if you know where, uh, when I grew up at the back of the restaurant, there's two rooms up at the, at the restaurant, there's a second story, two rooms, I slept in the same room as that, and my sister slept in the same room as that. I'm not saying the court is the more, that was the more cross at the time, but again, it can be scalable and scaled to, you know, the, the individual circumstances, you know, the build homes for 2,400 square feet or whatever. I mean, um, there are people on it. Uh, probably, if I can say, way over the world. And when you get in terms of prices, do you have that? I think you said it Do you have those resources in place that could carry you through? For a year in these difficult circumstances, and I would say, probably in some cases, that is not the case. I want to turn to our last subject because I'm just cautious of time here, Willie. And that is, of course, my favorite subject is tourism, 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 tourism. I love I love traveling. I love uh, well, I loved traveling. Not not a lot over the last few years during COVID-19. But here we are. Um, if I was a tourist coming to Clarington tomorrow, in your words, in your words, what would you suggest a tourist do in Newcastle, Clarington, that is a unique gem that often gets overlooked. Well, one thing that, and again, what is bigger in our area, as you know, Chris, I mean, we have the beauty of a rural and urban mix. And uh, out of that, now, if I look at Clarington, we're about the size land-wise of Toronto, or you could, we've often said you could drop Pickering Ajax with the Oshawa in the Clarington. So that gives you the large expanse of Clarington. And I would say probably about 20% of that land mass is developed, and mostly in the uh, urban areas along the Lakeshore, Curtis, Longville, and Newcastle. Now you have new, your little hammocks in the corner. And uh, what has caught on now, and if you haven't been back this way, you have to see this behavior tourism. The people, if I can say that are flocking to our communities, and I would say most of them, if not a majority of them, out of the municipality, I would say probably more from the city of Toronto, I have that agriculture that farming experience. They come out, they pick blueberries, they come out and pick apples. Now, I, there is something unique that's going on, and it's a number of different uh, uh, um, agricultural businesses, and they call it the uh, country, uh, country farm. So they have it laid out, and you can get the experience of a pumpkin farmer, you can get the experience of an organic beef farmer, beekeeping, uh, country herbalist. Uh, uh, if you want to say cider making, uh, wine making, uh, egg farmers, dairy farmers, Christmas tree growers, and again, they have it mapped out where you can about it'd be no different. And if you're familiar, and maybe to some of your uh, viewers, uh, what Prince Edward County has done, which is just east of us. And they've made that a tourist destination, and this is what we are trying to do. When somebody comes up, they can have a map and experience where you can visit different locations. So in, without, uh, I'd say, any one specific, we do offer quite a bit for paying the tourism. I'll do a shameless plug because Willie won't say it, but if you come to uh, the Ward 3 and 4 in Clarington, you need to check out Tyrone Mill. I'm not sure if it's still operating after all this time, but the Tyrone Gr Mill is one of the best places to get apple cider in all of Ontario. Yes, that's right. I'm going to do a shameless plug here. All of Ontario to get your best apple cider. <laughs> well, you know, it, it is just right there. Uh, that's the one where, again, uh, Chris, you got to remember, we have the county donuts. And also, it is a working zone. 
It certainly is. My last, oh, go ahead, Willie. Pardon me? And we also have Pete I need to come back. Uh, I need to come back and make sure I go up to Tyro next time I'm back. My last question for you, Willie, and I want to thank you so much for doing this and take some time if you want to answer this question. But what makes the municipality of Clarington such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, I still might think this, this, I've been here all my life. Now, I'll go back, and if people haven't uh, done their uh, mathematics, when we moved here in 54, I'm 68 years old, so I'm rooted in the community. Uh, I still believe in that small town charm. Uh, as I said earlier in the interview, I go out and welcome people into the community, just like the new family is welcome into the community. And uh, as we go, I think that's important that uh, yesterday we just had a couple fest in Womanville where they closed down the street. And we, we started with apples is one of the biggest, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, the Roma in itself and the other apple farmers, we were probably one of the largest producers of apples in Canada. Now, uh, prior to that, at the start, we closed down the streets in Newcastle. And, uh, we had Newcastle uh, uh, Festival, Harvest Festival. Uh, we also do that in Womanville with, uh, as we come into the New Year and Spring Maple Fest, Maple Syrup is big in the community. So it's those things that are trying to keep that small town charm here as we grow. And again, a lot of that may have to do, and again, that I get back to planning, you know, how we plan our communities rather than. In some respects, they may look like cookie cutter communities, but how do we make it such that they have a uniqueness even in the themselves? Um, and I think that is important. Uh, but and I think most of the for the people that move in here and feel like that in the community, that we open ourselves up, open up our arms. And uh, uh, I think that in itself is, a, I wouldn't say an opportunity, I wouldn't call it a challenge opportunity for ourselves to do that and uh, certainly I'm coming upon myself um, I can just a shameless plug for Algoma because I every time I go grocery shopping with my husband and we go to the apple sections to get our apples I guarantee you yell at my husband if he picks up anything but Algoma apples out here in Calgary and every time I see them it takes me back to my hometown so uh, if you're in Alberta you know Algoma's apples you may not know where they're from but they're from Newcastle Ontario uh, the heart and soul of my, my, me and this show um, Willie I want to thank you so much for doing this for sitting down and talking about yourself the next term uh, what you see as an issue facing uh, the community heading into your uh, next term, but also some tourism. So thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome, Chris. And it's been a long time. I'm glad to catch up with you. I'm so proud of your success out there. And when you're ever in the area, you know, I think the last time we did get together was with Ward 4 Councillor, Wendy Partner, and uh, we got together at the Snug. Shameless plug there because yep. the Snug was where my parents started our restaurant back in 1954. And uh, it's like going home for me, going in there. It's gone from Chinese to Irish, and I'm so proud of the current owners and the success that they made of that. But uh, yes, no, please. Uh, the first round's on me, Chris. Awesome. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. As I say, always put down social media, put down Twitter, put down Facebook, put down Instagram, put down TikTok and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society. It helps our democracy and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. <laughs>